Hello, everyone. Can you hear me today? Okay, great. Um, welcome to the June 5 Mimi interim. I see people are trickling in here. So first up, um, let's remember the note well, which addresses the policies under which we uh, conduct this meeting. Please familiarize yourself with it. I think we have a note taker who is Tim today. So thank you, Tim, for agreeing to take notes. And for our agenda today, we're gonna to be talking about metadata privacy, um, picking up some of the conversations we've been having on the mailing list about this and following up from our prior interim on this topic. Brendan is going to walk us through some examples live using uh, whiteboard, hopefully that works. Um, so no slides today. Does anybody want to bash the agenda? Okay, hearing none, I think we can, oh, Rowan. I just wanted to make an announcement that uh, probably before the end of, uh, by the end of today, uh, maybe tomorrow, there'll be a new version of the content document that has the CBOR, um, the, the CBOR binary format, like fully in there as the only format. Just an FYI to folks. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll look for that update on the list. Okay. Brendan, you are up. Uh, so, hi. Uh, I saw this morning that Rowan sent an email to the list um, saying that. Discussing the, the invalid commit problem requires in-depth details of MLS and that this should happen in MLS and not Mimi. Um, I just wanted to ask you to expand on that on in terms of like what work you want to send to the MLS working group. I mean, I think that both Britta and Richard said this pretty well, but like if you've got if if somebody could come up with if this if the problem that we have in Mimi is a problem that somebody could have outside of Mimi with MLS, then we should discuss it in MLS. Um, if the thing that we're talking about, as Richard said, is talking about an invalid commit because of something that Mimi did, that wouldn't be a problem, wouldn't make the commit invalid outside of Mimi, then we then we should discuss it in Mimi. So my problem with that was, um, I believe with Richard's email, he said, um, let me see if invalid means discussions of the ways in which commits go bad and the possibilities for detecting that badness get very MLS technical. And these problems are MLS general, not Mimi specific. Um, So, I mean, so you've, you've focused on a lot of effort on invalid commits. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, pl there's plenty of stuff that we can talk about, about what the privacy, what the, you know, privacy properties are of, you know, the, for example, like Richard's email with four different, you know, here are four different things, four different sort of privacy levels that we, we might choose. Um, there are implications that are visible to users that have to do with whether you can be offline or whether clients can be offline or not and read messages at different times. There are all sorts of sort of user visible things that I think are relevant to Mimi that we can discuss about, you know, what, what, what are the requirements for the thing that we're building and what are the privacy and what, you know, the privacy requirements are for, for the system. Um, so, it, you know, if, if you start with that, I think we're going to have a good productive discussion. <laughs> okay, well, sure, let's start with that. Um, so in that thread, uh, I believe a lot of the feedback that we got was Richard listed four different models. A was, I believe, closer to what we currently do, which is the hub and the followers can see group info and membership. 
B was that the hub can see group info and membership, but followers only see local membership. So the hub can see everything, but followers only see things that are local to their um, their own members. Uh, C was that the hub can see group info and pseudonymous membership, whereas followers only see local membership. So followers only see things that are related to um, their own members, but the hub can kind of see everybody, but it sees everybody behind a pseudonym. And then model D was that each provider can only see local membership, which is closer to um, what I've been sharing with the group. And a lot of the feedback that we got on that was, um, I like D, but I don't think that it's possible. Um, and nobody ever really expanded on why they don't think it's possible. So that's um, where the idea came from today to basically talk to concerns people have and try to like whiteboard examples. So are there any specific examples of things where people don't um, know how to do a specific thing in the context of the proposal that I made? Yeah, um, so I'm surprised other people aren't, aren't chiming in here, but we we have we have requirements for client for multiple clients for offline users where somebody can add a new client and begin sending to in begin sending in the room immediately. Um, that's one. Um, another one, it, it, that sort of general one is that we have a number of. Uh, a number of the providers who say that their customers are asking them for the ability to enforce some level of um, some level of uh, of policy uh, enforcement, which they can't which they can't do unless at least the hub has knows the roster. I'll stop there. Maybe somebody else has something interesting to say. So the first one you said was that when all the members of a group are offline, someone can still join that group and start sending. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Most most important in like one on one groups or you know in very small groups. So it's not clear to me that whether it's doable or not, but it's not. But it's not also not clear to me how you propose to do it when um. Invalid commits are generated. Um, let's say for the moment policy invalid commits are generated, and now you have some 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 uh, um, uh, nodes having one one set of groups and one set of another set of groups. How do you plan to manage that? Oh, so specifically the problem of how do you handle the case when someone sends when a fragmented update when, path? When it's forked, yes. As I say, I'm not saying this is unhandleable. I'm just saying I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't you do not yet understand how you propose to handle it. Um, okay, so to work through this for the first example of external joins. So um, this is kind of the diagram that I drew before of, well, basically, whenever you start a group, you start out with a single, basically, epoch, a single box where all those messages go. Inside of this one box, all of the messages are linearly ordered. Um, and when you write messages to the epoch, you write an application message, you write an application message, each of these dashes in the line is gonna be an application message. And then when you are done with the group, you send a commit um, and that commit immediately creates a new epoch. Um, so, and then that epoch is sort of correlated implicitly with that commit because it was created right after um, right after that commit was sent. And then you can start sending application messages to this one. And all of these boxes are basically stored separately on the server. They all have identifiers. So maybe this was box A, and maybe this was box B. And this identifier is derived from the MLS key schedule in an unpredictable way where you would only ever be able to know B if you successfully process this commit right here. Um, 
So the way that you do external joins in the context of this is that you will have a group and this group has a series of commits. Um, and whenever people send their commit, um, one of the things that they send with their commit is the group info that is associated with box B. So, so a commit in this context here is actually an MLS commit plus a group info for the subsequent epoch. Um, and so whenever the DS is basically hosting this group, um, it can see that this commit got sent right here. Um, then it knows that uh, it sees that the commit got sent. It sees that everybody processed it. It sees that everybody moved to box B. And so the conclusion for the DS is that box B is the most recent epoch for this group. Um, and so whenever someone wants to externally join the group, and he's red, um, and we're going to kind of draw over here like a little protocol diagram of like DS and then user. So the DS sends this group info for epoch B to the user. And then the user sends back an external commit that corresponds to the group info. Um, and we're gonna denote the external commit with a little red diamond. Um, so then the DS takes this little red diamond and it um, pops it right into here. It never tells the user specifically about epoch B. I think that from the group info, you can't compute anything about group or, or about epoch B. You can just create your external commit and an external commit can be added to group B. Um, and then what happens is that if the users see this diamond and they like it and they accept it, then everybody will process it and move on to the next epoch, which is epoch C. And boop, boop, boop. So how does the hub have the group info and not have metadata about the group? So if you support external join, then protecting metadata of the group is kind of pointless because anybody can just like join the group and then they immediately know who's in the group. So like supporting external join is not compatible with um, having private group membership, if that makes sense. I don't think that, that I don't think that that does make sense, but I think that you're, you've not stated that quite, quite correctly, but I'll let Conrad go first. Okay. Um, can you hear me? I'm sure I'm on my yes. microphone works. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. So the first question, starting with the, the group info, um, how does the, so does the group info in this scenario include the registry? Uh, yes, the group info includes the ratchet tree. So this is kind of this is one of the uh, one where I see advantages of not having encrypted handshake messages because the DS can actually track the group state. In small groups, this is not much of a problem probably, but in bigger groups and or if you use a PQ cipher suite that has big public keys, the overhead here is going to be substantial if you upload a, the whole ratchet tree every time you do a commit. Right. Um, this does... This goes back to what I was saying before about, um, well, I mean, I guess that external joins, no, it does, okay. External joins always mean that the group membership is public because anybody is able to just immediately join this group. And then when you're joined to the group, you're able to see the ratchet tree and all the members of the group. So it's not possible to support external joins and also have private group membership. So um, the issue that you're talking about with it being slow to upload, upload the whole ratchet tree, that is more so an issue for sending welcomes. Um, and you're right that it can be an issue for sending welcomes, but um, addressing that can can kind of be handled separately from external joins. Yeah, so I'd be interested in how we would handle that 
separately because I don't see it ever be as efficient if as if we just track the the group. And then on the notion of uploading a group info, meaning that the metadata is necessarily going to be public because anyone can join. I don't think that's quite true either. For example, if you have a user um, that has multiple clients and you just want to have another client of the same user join, then that user could join on the Mimi auth, like authenticate itself on the Mimi auth level, and then uh, want to join the group anyway. And there's no metadata privacy leak because the user is it, because not not any you know any client of any user can join the group, but only clients of users that are already participating in the group can join. So I think there are there are like, definitely uh, you know cases where the the two you know having metadata privacy and having a group info uploaded to the server are not mutually exclusive. That's definitely a super interesting use case if you can do external joins just for other clients of people that are already in the group. Then yeah, it wouldn't have to be public. So, and, and I mean, that's just one way of doing some authentication. That means uh, not everyone can join the group. It could be, you know, uh, I don't know, we could have stuff on the Mimi level like using the invite links, for example, that Rohan talked about in earlier Mimi meetings. But yeah, I think I'll just mm -hmm. leave the queue for now and let Rohan continue. Hey, uh, okay. So, um, in, so, uh, I, 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 I'm trying to figure out what privacy problem we're solving if we're if we're adopting this this third use here that if if we have if we have pseudonyms for that that are you know per group pseudonyms for every user and the um, and the the you know commits are sent to the are, are the, the the hub gets to see every every commit and every proposal, um, but the followers do not. Um, what the hub knows basically is how many at any given epic how many. Uh, member how many mls members how many devices from from each uh are present from each provider and of course any of their you know any of their local providers if if the if their interface allows that and so there's you know that there's your your model here was based on this this idea that um, that you would have a hub would know even less, but then when I asked about these external commits, then in this case the the answer seemed to be well you can't get this property that I you know that I came up with this architecture for unless uh, unless you again give the hub the ability to see. The, the entire roster. So did I understand that correctly? So supporting external commits is, um, I mean, supporting external commits for people who are not already in the group is I think a different problem or it's something that I think is maybe separable from the rest of Mimi, from the rest of Mimi. Like you can have groups that support external commits from people who are not in the group. Um, and when you do that, in that case, the group membership is already public because you're supporting these external joins from outside people. So it makes sense just to have unencrypted handshake messages. Um, but the thing about my proposal is that it does not, or the thing about my proposal is not that uh, it's super privacy forward in that um, everything always has to be completely 100% encrypted and private and like secret from the DS. Um, all that my proposal does is it allows you to turn handshake encryption on or off. Like it's a choice. Do you want handshake encryption on or off? Um, do you want some MLS extension that gives you, you know, additional functionality with the handshake encryption on or off? Um, so okay. that's the thing about yeah. Uh, so I, I'm just gonna I'm gonna just gonna say that what I specifically propose on the list, if, if we want, if the the privacy characteristics that we want are are the that third you know C. Um, you can you can 
still do uh, a private handshake message, you could include the hash of the uh, framed message inside of the uh, AAD, and then you could send the you could send another copy of the the framed message that contains the commit directly encrypted directly for the hub. Then the hub would have the commit, um, and it could reconstruct the group info. Um, it would have the roster. The followers wouldn't have that information. Um, and you know the, that would be a relatively minor change to what's mm -hmm. in the current document. But this requires the use of pseudonyms. Yeah. I believe the problem with pseudonyms was that it had a lot of restrictions on when people can actually join groups and like who can actually add people to groups. Um, um, I, I didn't hear anybody voice any concrete use cases that, right, be, that I thought were um, not uh, Because you have this, this encryption key for being able to decrypt the ratchet tree. So the consequence of that is that if you ever externally join a group, like we're talking about doing here, if you externally join a group, when you join, you're not able to decrypt the ratchet tree initially. You're not able to decrypt the pseudonyms immediately, I mean. Um, so you don't know who's in the group. Ah, okay, so you're saying that the verification of who else is in the group, that you wouldn't be able to tell the real identity of those people in until after until it was too late effectively did I, did yeah I essentially when you join a group you don't know the members of the group until um someone of that group comes online and can tell you the, the decryption key for the pseudonyms which seems like a weird case mm -hmm. okay Fair enough. okay i will let all this So um, I want to understand if the idea here is that all of this gets applied on a group by group basis, because it's pretty clear, I think, from the past discussion in the working group that having a mode where you can do external joins is, um, is expected, right? Um, so our, is the expectation that the creator of the group would choose whether this is a super private and secure group, and therefore, um, uh, it will have all of these. You know, it will be designed in this way, the way that you just described. And then there's another option, which is not private vis-a-vis -vis the hub or the other, um, uh, the other providers. And also, how does that work? Given that the hub will then sometimes know the identity of users and sometimes not. And it's the same users who are in the different groups. Uh, so you're exactly right that this would be a group by group thing where it depends on the group, whether the group is, um, whether the group has private membership from the hub or not is basically um, a decision of the group creator or it's something that's negotiated by all of the members of the group. I think in the gist that I shared, I said that there would be like a little key package extension that, um, you know, maybe would support negotiation in some way. So everybody would have the extension that says, you know, do I require um, public membership or not for some reason? Um, and then if no one requires public membership, then you just encrypt the handshake messages. Um, so yeah, it's a group by group basis. It's a decision of someone whether the handshake messages are encrypted or not. Uh, and then the second question about, what was the second question? Um, I just wonder if, the same hub having um, the same users in groups with private membership and groups with non-private membership creates a way to de-anonymize the users even when they're in the group with private membership. No, um, that shouldn't be possible. I mean, if you're in a group with public membership, then the DS knows which groups you're in. And if you're in a group with private membership, then it doesn't. So it's okay. a separation, yeah.
Okay, first of all, I uh, just wanted to uh, say, I think we do need two modes. We need some sort of flag that allows groups with metadata privacy and without. That seems like fairly natural to me. Uh, and that's kind of independent, I think, from whatever method we go for or we end up going for either the handshake encryption or the pseudonymity or maybe a mix of both, who knows? Uh, and then, yeah, and the other one just wanted to confirm with the pseudonymous approach, if that's the one that Rafael and I put forward. Uh, yeah, so there is the difficulty of uh, new members having to know a secret key to de-pseudonymize uh, existing group members. But I would argue that you, if you want to protect the privacy somehow, uh, you need some sort of secret information that distinguishes the hub from uh, other group members. So I think if we like, uh, of course, may maybe that's uh, that's not quite true, but I would assume that we need some sort of distinguishing factor here, whatever um, whatever method we go for. So, yeah. What do you mean we need a distinguishing factor? Uh, I mean, something that distinguishes the, the information that the hub has from the information that the users have. If if you want this extra like this external join where someone can join the group completely without any interaction with existing group members, mm -hmm. um, then you either leak all the metadata uh, by you know uploading everything. That's fine, if if that's what you want, or you share some sort of secret information that then allows the new group member to somehow get access to the metadata that the hub does not have access to or it's not meant to have access to. So I think there needs to be something. Uh, there that's necessarily going to make joining tricky without the help of an insider. Uh, yeah, but if there's other ways, I'm of course open to hear it. it just seems implausible to me. So I guess that's me. Um, I'm honestly kind of having trouble keeping track of all the details of the schemes we're talking about here. I, I recall that we got kind of a presentation walkthrough of, of Brendan's scheme. Has this been written down in, in kind of draft form? Because I think that might help flush out some of these details. Um, so that's mm -hmm. one, one point. And the other thing I'll respond to something I was said earlier, I think, <clears throat> Brendan, you're, I, I broadly agree that we have a pretty hard trade-off between enabling new devices to show up and this uh, <clears throat> privacy property from the hub. So I think that's like capturing those sort of trade-offs um, would be something good to do when, when comparing these it kind of goes to that, what's the privacy model question. Uh, yeah, so I mean, this is written up in a gist that I shared on GitHub with, or on the list previously. It's not written up in draft format though. Okay, so um, some information that group members have and that the hub doesn't and that allows clients to discover who is actually in the group. So I think in the, like the canon of MLS, if handshake messages are encrypted, then that secret information is just the MLS key schedule where you can only add people to the group if you can send a welcome for the group that's valid. Um, and if the, the handshake message isn't encrypted, then you can do external joins um, and then there is no private information. And we can definitely work on like gradients between that, like Conrad said earlier, the idea of being able to only have external joins for uh, new clients of existing members. I thought that was a really good idea and um, seems like a straightforward thing to work on, Eric. Hello, your hand is up. Sorry. Um, I, I also, like Richard, had a little trouble following all the things being discussed here. Um, uh, um, I did look at the gist, but frankly, it's a little sketchy. So um, I think really uh, a draft probably is the next stage of the equation. Um, um, and then I think, um, depending on how that goes, maybe the design team. But um, 
Uh, I, I think I think that this is turning it a little bit difficult to track for people. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, and just to check in, do people feel like they understand the external commit flow here roughly in terms of this proposal? Just to be clear or to make sure I understand, in, in this scheme, uploading a group info means leaking the metadata to the hub. Uh, mm, not necessarily. I mean, you could have an MLS extension. Like, I think that when you proposed uh, the, the pseudonym extension that you were working on, I said that it would be really interesting to apply that same encryption to the ratchet tree instead of applying it to people's credentials. Um, because then what you would have is you would have a way for um, whenever someone sends a group changing the ratchet tree, they could update the encrypted ratchet tree with a logarithmic amount of data. Um, and then that would make it easy to have groups where the handshake messages are encrypted, um, but you could still do basically assisted joins where I send a welcome um, and the welcome has like the hash of the ratchet tree, but you have to go download the ratchet tree encrypted from somewhere else. Um, right. So, so I, I remember you you uh, you suggested that, and we did think about it. We did kind of walk through it a bit, and what we ended up with is that if you did that, you would always like if you do a commit, you have an update path, so you have to update the essentially your path and the encrypted ratchet tree thus leaking who the sender is, at least within the tree. And that again, leaks metadata about you kind of. So that's, you know, you can do it kind of, but it's in the end, the metadata, you, you lose a lot of the metadata benefit that you get from encrypting handshake messages. And then I don't... of course, if you encrypt the group info, just, sorry, one, one second. If you encrypt the group info, you again need to encrypt it with some sort of key that then again needs to be shared. And then you end up in the same situation that you're in with the pseudonymous approach, where you need to share some sort of key with anyone who wants to join to allow them to actually decrypt that kind of stuff that all of the, the registry. So, on the first point of you lose some of the metadata protections, I don't think that you lose the protections at all. I think this is exactly what we expect. Um, which is if I am a local provider, then I can kind of see directly which of my members are participating in the group. I can see whenever they send a commit and update the ratchet tree. I can see where they are in the ratchet tree um, sort of indirectly like you were talking about. But if I'm a hub provider and I'm interacting with follower providers, then whenever I see changes coming into the group, um, I can see like some, subse some subsection of the ratchet tree belongs to members from this follower provider, but I don't know anything about those members. Um, so I think that's kind of exactly what we expect. Well, I mean, I see the, the hub provider would see the direct path that was changed. And so it would know who in the tree the commit would come from. It can see whether commits come from the same people or not, but it can't see uh, that person's identity or anything. No, exactly. and. That's similar thing in the pseudonymous approach. So, you know, you kind of you degrade privacy to the point where it the, the thing, there's not that much of a distinguishing advantage over the pseudonymous approach. And, I mean, a bit to be fair, you know, if you do a a remove and you blank a path, then you don't really know if I'm updating a path or if I'm blanking a path if you're doing the encryption right and stuff. But it degrades in the direction of the pseudonymous approach. Let's say it that way. I'm still not sure that it does because in the um, in the pseudonymous approach, you have to do this like um, key exchange with anyone that you want to be able to add to a group. 
here you don't have that issue. So if you just encrypt the ratchet tree directly, then what can happen is that I can fetch a key package for you without any prior consent from you. Um, I can fetch that key package, I can add it to the group, I can uh, encrypt that key package so that nobody can see who I'm adding to the group, or at least nobody who's outside of the group can see who I'm adding to the group. Um, Right, the whole key package thing, you get away without having a mitigation error. That's true. That's true. So so you don't need that. But what I, what I was saying is that you need a, if you want someone to join externally without any help from an existing like online group member, then that person or that client needs the information required to actually decrypt the ratchet tree. And then again, you need to share, share some sort of secret out of band. No, exactly. Like we talked about earlier, if you're supporting external joins, then having encrypted handshake messages isn't going to work in the first place. Like you have to do something else. Well, I thought you meant that we could have encrypted handshake messages and then do this uh, partial updates of the ratchet tree using the encryption method. I thought that, okay, maybe we've been talking past each other. No, those are different points. So supporting external joins is the problem of someone who has never been in the group being able to join the group. Um, what we were talking about with being able to encrypt the, the ratchet tree with what you were talking about um, with, with your proposal is assisted joins. So what that means is that I can send a welcome to someone and add them to the group. And maybe the group has a quadrillion members in it, but um, the the amount of data that I have to upload to send that welcome is still small. I That's see. what we want. Okay, I see what you mean. Yep, that makes sense. So that you could do, yeah. but the metadata question would still be the same. More or less in terms of what the hub sees and what it doesn't see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. It is some linkage. Okay, so um, moving on to the second point that I think Richard brought up policy enforcement. So my proposal, or in my proposal, um, this all has to be client side. So clients are the only ones that are ever trusted to actually enforce policy. And I think that is kind of um, a, natural, a natural result of MLS being an encryption protocol that you can't really look into it and see what's happening. So it's intentional. Um, so all of the policy enforcement in terms of like saying like Alice can't add someone to the group um, that would only be able to be enforced by individual clients. Um, and of course, it also means that everybody needs to have consistent rules for what policy enforcement is so that everybody enforces policy evenly. And um, what would happen if someone ever sent an invalid commit? So going back to this diagram, um, Let's say that someone sends, well, the colors are gonna be confusing. Um, let's say that someone sends an external join here, um, but we don't like this person. Um, we don't think they should be allowed to externally join because maybe they are not a new client of an existing member or something. Um, so what all the clients or what all the members of Epoch V would do is they would all just, ignore that and skip straight over it um, and then go to this next external commit, which is valid. So that's how policy enforcement works. Does that, uh, Rowan? Um, so in this case, there would you would basically fork, right? I mean, because whoever sent the first external commit would, that would create that would create a new epic, and since the the DS would presumably take the first one of those that it got and assume that it was correct, unless it had reason to believe otherwise, and it would and it would offer that you know the hash of D to everybody, and people who didn't you know basically everybody else except for the sender would say, hmm, like, I don't like that. That looks invalid. Um, and then they would need to go and explicitly request C at that point. Did I understand that correctly? 
Um, so you're correct that it's a fork, but I think the fork is less of an issue than you're saying, because whenever we fork, the sender um, who sent this commit, the first invalid external commit, what happens is that they get this new epoch D, um, and then they would essentially be sitting in D alone, because everybody else would see that, and they would proceed to C. So there is a fork, but just, just one person yeah. is here alone, and then everybody else is here. I, so yeah, I, I understand, but but everybody else didn't get C. They had to request C. So they didn't have to request C. why didn't they get C? Or why just, they... What do you mean when you say they? What do you mean when you say they have to request C? So you're so in your under the modification of your gist. You're saying that both D and C are delivered to every to everybody. This is, yeah, this is the part I mean, I'm confused on too. Can I can I try to restate maybe and see if I understand correctly? Yeah, Which please. Is, yeah. That in your version of this, does the hub and all other entities just blindly put forward any message for anyone that thinks is a group participant? Um, because there's yeah. no way to determine whether 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 D or C is valid. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. And I mean, that does sound kind of severe saying that we will push forward any message that might be from anyone. Um, yeah, I mean, my concern is that this basically, yeah, okay, I, I, maybe this isn't, this isn't a denial of service amplification attack. Uh, because you're sending both DNC. If you had to request C, then this would be a potential amplification attack. Um, but mm -hmm. still, like, the fact that you could cause more messages to be fanned out, that it, it doesn't feel great, but I don't see immediately a problem with it. So, so I think this actually gets back to the, the third question, which I was asking, which is, how do you resolve these issues? And it, it seems to me the answer is you say you don't, right? Namely, that um, that as far that, that you simply have a, you simply have a partition, and that everybody bad is on one side of the partition, everybody good in there is on the other partition, and that's fine. Is that a fair description of how you think this resolves? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, um, so. I, I, that, that is like making the clients like a lot more load bearing um, in terms of like any defect in the client potentially creates an un, an, 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 a large undiscovered and undiscoverable um, partition. Um, so if you say, say, I have a pair, say I have a pair of clients or some same implementer, which both, which both implement the policy incorrectly, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and so, that, so I set a bogus update um, or I set the bogus update or whatever. And now I'm just partitioned off. And it's like, I'm not even sure how, how I find that out. Do you have an answer how they find that out? Um, so what I said when we talked about this at the, sorry, can you mute? Yeah, oh, sure. Sorry, thank you. Um, so what I said when the question was asked at the last interim, which I don't think you liked very much, um, was that if you have two clients from the same implementer that both implement like buggy logic where they send a bogus commit and they go off in their own fork, essentially what happens is you just let that fork exist and you let those people go off on their own fork. And it's basically a human problem to say, you know, hey, you have a bug, you need to fix this. And I remember you saying you didn't like that because you didn't think it was operational, operationalizable. Um, but I mean, bugs are kind of by definition not operationalizable. Like someone has to do something to fix them. Well, but my point is it's not even detectable. Is the situation you the situation as I understand it is I just stop getting messages from everybody. It's detectable so, but, by by, uh, by who? By the hub who can see that there's now two forks in this group. Right, because the option is the two people who go off on the fork, either we break the client and the client stops working immediately and forever as soon as they do this, or we allow them to go off on their fork and the person who runs the hub can see you know, all the clients from this one implementer are buggy. Well, right, this is in fact why I asked you to like write down the draft, right? Because like those are two different things. And, um, and so, 
like I no, I don't think that being silent is acceptable. Um, and I think if the hub is supposed to do something, then we have to describe what the hub is supposed to do. Um, and um, and, and like, and so I, I think and this is like worse than like the hub actually doing some filtering, right? Because other than some filtering, it actually has an opportunity to tell to tell to reject the thing so the client doesn't get forked out. So like your your proposal is I'm just is I'm just like purchased off for days or weeks until like until my imputation is fixed, and that is like a substantial worse experience, right? So um, so so I th so I think like really this does need some recovery mechanism that is better than that. I can imagine a number, but I but that's in his hands than that. Okay, yeah. So I think that the solution that we would have here is essentially whenever the DS sees that there's a fork, so we see that this group has gone off in two forks, and we don't know why. Um, it's still essentially a bug where there's you know something that could be looked into by a human, but also you could just do kind of a rough group consensus where it's not a blocking consensus in terms of like everybody needs to agree before we can go to the next epoch. Uh, just the DSCs, you know, everybody went off on C and this person is in D alone. That that can't be right that this person is in D alone and everyone else is in C. So what we're going to do is just like oops, terminate the group and say you can't send messages to epoch D anymore. Um, and then that would prompt the client to do a re-external join, and then they would re-externally join back into C. So, um, and what happens if the majority of the group is the defective ones? If the majority of the group is the defective one, um, I don't know what to do there. Okay. Well, I think I guess I guess what I'm asking is not for you to solve this problem with the microphone. What I'm asking for you is to solve the, is to solve the problem on paper, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and, and 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 or or, or that we mark an unsolved problem and then we say it's to solve or something. But like that's what I'm asking for. Okay. Okay. So I think that um, that is policy enforcement kind of wrapped up. Richard, since that was was your point, does that sound at all acceptable to you? Or is it really important that the DS, as someone who is outside of the protocol, can enforce this policy? Is the screen share broken? It, it seems right to me. Yeah, I, I see the screen share as well. Uh, again, I, th I think I need to look at a document and really understand the approach here, but um, it's not totally implausible to me that uh, we could, as Ecker said, make the clients more load bearing uh, in terms of policy enforcement. But yeah, I'd like to see a document. Okay, that sounds good. Um, also, in terms of fragmented update path, so um, the update path is kind of a specific problem where if you list the ways that an MLS group can break, there are Fragmented update paths and then there's everything else. And the key thing about everything else is that um, everybody agrees when the group breaks in any other way other than a fragmented update path. Um, so everyone agrees. And so you can follow this kind of branching dynamic pretty clearly when the group breaks in basically any other way. But when you have a fragmented FDA path, everyone does not agree. It's sort of natural that one subgroup of the group is not going to agree with everyone else. Um, so that's the work that I would propose sending to the MLS working group to create some kind of extension to deal with this in some potentially tractable way.
So Brendan, um, we already have the authentication code, um, which at least allows you to detect if there is a fragmented update path. Um, the authentication code, is that basically a secret that's derived from the key schedule, which just everybody wants to agree on? Yeah, every, you, uh, you can hear the, I, I, I think I think in the in the RFC it's called the Epoch Authenticator, which yes is a value derived off the key schedule that you know, is derived using some label from the Epoch secret and reflects agreement on the Epoch secret and all that entails. Okay, yeah. So I mean, detecting that, um, detecting that people have forked off is actually relatively easy. Because when you have a fragmented update path, what's going to happen is you're going to have this dynamic up here, which is that people go off in two different forks. And that's immediately detectable by um, uh, by the DS at any rate. And of course, you can also give the users some kind of mechanic for seeing that people have gone off in different forks. Um, you can give the, the clients a mechanism for seeing that some clients are in different forks than another one. Um, the problem here is more so um, opening up the, the MLS key schedule a little bit and proving to the DS that the update path in this commit was fragmented. And because of that, this person should be banned and I should be allowed to rejoin. That's uh, the work for MLS. Um, it's actually being able to update, uh, being able to, to, to open up the MLS key schedule a little bit to prove that someone did something bad but without breaking the, the security guarantees of MLS. And that's also why that needs to be um, sent to the MLS working group is because it's a pretty direct cryptography problem to say like, hey, I want this like internal part of the, the key schedule that I want to share with my DS to prove misbehavior. Um, but I want to do that in a way that's not going to um, compromise my own security. So it's not detecting the problem, it's proving it in a court of law is the problem. Okay. Um, so that is all of all of the points that we had written down earlier. Is there anything else where people feel like they don't know how to do something that they need to do in the context of the proposal that I shared? Or are we done? Everybody understands this proposal. Yes. Um, I, so, I, well, I mean, I, I think that several people have said that they'd like to see, you know, more details uh, written down. Written up, yeah. But, um, like, in broad strokes, I feel like I, I am getting the gist of what, what you want to do. Uh, but I'm not getting a, you know, I'm not getting a strong sense of from a privacy perspective why we need to do um why we need to do this approach in order to get some privacy property and then in terms of um a fragmented update path i'm also not you know if this is a problem that we solve in mls this uh, i'm not seeing why we need to go with you know one approach or the other based on on that because it would that would that solution from the MLS working group would work in either you know would work for for any of any of the approaches that people have discussed including well, it wouldn't. we no longer have you know are, are like working with um so that I mean if if you do want to talk about invalid commits um we have to dig a little bit deeper into the ways that MLS can break um so with I, my yeah. proposal, the, the only thing that needs to be remanded to the MLS working group is this right here, which is the fragmented update path. We need some way to see a little bit deeper into MLS to make sense of that. The thing that my proposal has different from every other proposal is that it handles all of the everything else problems, right? Because in my proposal, if you send a commit with an invalid Mac or um, an invalid signature or whatever, 
I, I think people want to see writing up the everything else. Like maybe maybe Conrad has something to say about that. Uh, no, I mean I I agree, and we we had this discussion that uh, even in even in the approach where we have public handshake messages, there are things that can go wrong, and you pointed out that can go wrong uh, that are not detectable by the uh, by the DS. Um, I think, and I wrote in in one of the mails that I think it's this is kind of somewhat orthogonal, um, and by that I don't mean that. Um, it depends, like depending on the approach we take, this might enable uh, encrypted handshake messages or not. But whatever approach we have for encrypted handshake messages, we can also deploy for unencrypted handshake messages, is what I was trying to say. And so maybe we should discuss this somewhat independently in terms of uh, what what do we actually want? What kind of guarantees do we actually want? And then we can figure out like how do we square that with uh, the encryption or non-encryption of handshake messages. Does that does that make sense? I'm still kind of trying to wrap my head around when you say they're not orthogonal. You, I mean, because they're not orthogonal in the traditional sense of like solving one is independent of how we solve the other. Because if we solve the invalid commit problem in a specific way, um, that does very seriously impact how we're able to solve the metadata privacy problem, right? Because if we if we solve the invalid commit problem like this, where we have this hands off TS, um, then solving the metadata privacy problem is just a matter of turning on MLS handshake encryption. Um, if you don't need external commits, which many of us do. Yeah, I, I agree that they're they're linked certainly. Um, so yeah, maybe it makes sense to to discuss it in this context. But um, what was I going to say? Right. Yeah. And so so just to kind of try to figure out how we what we do next, what the action items, and one of them is is uh, is the write up write up that I think you already. Uh, you want you said you wanted to do on on your proposal, and you already have, I think, uh, a pretty thorough write up there. Um, but also, then maybe a comparison between the pseudonymous approach and the um, and the encrypted approach in terms of the functionality we get. How are they different in terms of the functionality we get or we don't get, and how are they different in terms of the privacy we get or we don't get? I think that that would be very helpful, and I'm happy to, uh, you know. Um, have out or or do this, and if if uh, yeah, if we want to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, this may just be a different version of what you just suggested, Conrad. But I feel that we're um, we struggle in part because we haven't written down what we think the the metadata privacy requirements actually are for Mimi. Um, in detail. And so maybe that would come out of the exercise that you just suggested, Conrad, but I, th I think we really need that to move forward in the next round of this conversation. So whether that's like a separate articulation of that from each of these two proposals, and then we can compare or a unified um, set of what those requirements are. And then we, we look at how the, the various proposals fare against them. But I feel like we keep like veering into different aspects of the solution that may or may not relate to requirements that some people think we do or don't do not have. And um, it would be a lot more clear if we had them written down and then we could use that as the benchmark. Yeah, thank you. Um... Okay. So do you have some action items, um, but I mean, unless Eric, you have some suggestion for like an example I could work through that would help you understand it, then I think I, I might be done for today. I, I, I'm not at the moment. Okay. 
I will write it up like you asked. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, so just to review what we think the action items are here. Um, so I think Brendan, you're gonna write your proposal up in more detail in a draft. That's one action item. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Okay. And then um, Conrad, I, I liked I, I liked what you suggested. Um, maybe you could you could restate <laughs> for the for the action items. Sure. Sure. Um, I'll try to find out what the diff is in terms of functionality and, and privacy between the pseudonymous, like the vanilla approach, the pseudonymous approach and the encryption approach. And I'll sync with Brandon to make sure that I, you know, I get it right in terms of the encrypted stuff, because some of some of it I might not have fully understood. If that's okay with you, Brandon. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay, that sounds good as far as next steps, I think. Anybody else have anything before we break? Okay, you get a whole hour back. Enjoy. See you on the list.